Hello everybody, hopefully everyone can hear me today. It's Wednesday, I think it's the 30th, is it the 30th? No, it is, what is the date today? It is the 1st, wow, April 1st, April Fool's Day. Woo, this is awesome. I get to do a tutorial or a uh, live stream on Wednesday morning on April Fool's. So just wanna make sure everyone can hear me out there. If you can, just Give me a shout out on the chat line and uh, I can make sure that we're doing okay here. I'm kind of flying solo today. Um, actually, I can put in a call. Oh, like the cut, bro. Hey, okay, great. Can you guys hear me okay out there? Kirk Michael, Joe Root. Uh, I'm going to put in a call to, uh, all right, I'm going to put in a call to Anita and see if she's she's around and say hello to her real quick. You know, as you know, she's in South Africa and it's probably, uh, it's late there, but we're gonna give her a call anyways. See if she picks up. Does she pick up? Does she? Hello, Anita. Hello. Hello, good morning from Seattle. How are you? I'm all right. What's you going on? You are live. You are live today. You're with me. Say uh, say hello great. to everybody. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I just put you up to the mic. Okay, we got Joe Root on, on here. We've got Life Fantasy X. We've got Kirk Michael. we got Alexi Ballian. And we've got, uh, let's see. Yep, that's it. That's who we got right now on my live stream. Uh, just wanted to say hello to you, Anita. How are you today? Did you... Oh, it's all, it's all right. I'm yeah? just watching the news. Yeah, trying to keep up with what the situation is here. So what is the situation before we get started with you in South Africa? How is How are things there? Well, I'm fine. Um, and all I can say is South Africa is trying to do its best right now. So Yes. As we are. So I got a question for you. Do you want to stay online with me today or do you want me to hang up and I just do my thing? That's up to you. Um, yeah. Uh, is it possible for you to do your thing because I'm also working on something else at the moment? So uh, oh, by the way, to... Anita is working incredibly hard on our new website which will be out momentarily. We have, we're just having some little technical hiccups, but we'll have that out there. And um, I will say when it gets, when it is up and live and ready to go, um, if you sign up to my newsletter, my blog, once it goes live, uh, there'll be a little gift for everyone there. So uh, with that being said, I, I will say have a great evening, Anita. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you later. All right, bye uh, everyone. Bye. All right. So, sounds like she is out. Let's let's uh, let's uh, call someone else here. Let's call my brother. How about that? Let's call Aaron. We're, we're gonna Facetime him real quick. See what if he picks up. Just just out of curiosity, he might not pick up. Oh, he is picking up. Hey, oh, hello. you're with me. I just saw that you're on there. I was just about to go inside because I'm sitting outside right now. Well, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. How are you? This is Aaron Blaze speaking live from his backyard. Yay. Well, how's the weather today, by the way? <laughs> it's uh, uh, 72 degrees, nice and cool. We had a nice front come through. It was awesome. Oh, look at this. We're, we're twinners today. Yeah. I, I said, I'm putting you next to, uh, don't, no, no, no. I'm putting you next to my face so everyone can see. We both have shaved heads. Yes, we do. Yes. Wow, it looks nice out there. Yep, we're on the deck, sitting on the deck, on the new deck. Nice. Well, hey, let me say hello to Faja over there. Let's say, oh. 
Is that fun? He can't see you, but... No. Hey, hey yeah. Pops. This is my hey, dad. Hey, Polly. So, How are yeah. you doing, Sonny? We're doing good. You're live with me on, on uh, the live stream today. No, you're kidding. No, yeah. Everyone can hear you. <laughs> Yeah, and there's there's pop. Oh, well, that's not pops. That was Aaron. So, and then, uh, and Vedanta's screwing. Oh. Look, look at this. Look at Vedanta. Say hello to everybody, Vedanta. Hi. Hi. Everybody. They're making a deck. She's laying down the deck. Yes. All right. Well, I'm gonna get do. I'm gonna just get to it and have a great day. All right. Have a good one. All right. See ya. Bye. All right, so there you go. They're out making a deck. Oh, so before I start, I was gonna do, I was thinking about what I would do today. And so I thought, let's just do a little fun exploration of character with stretch and squash and maybe add a little animation. But before I do that, I, um, I might, I might do this randomly now because I just pulled all of my stuff out of storage. Now I've had all of this stuff uh, of all my animation career when I was at Disney in a, just in the attic in different places and boxes and stuff and I hardly ever go into those but today I thought why not just pull out a box of random stuff and see what I pull out so I uh, I got this this is just one of like five of these boxes so I've got this box here and it's literally filled with random stuff. Uh, I was sort of a hoarder when I when I was at Disney, and so I, I kept a lot of my old drawings. Um, I kept a lot of my uh, some some animation tests uh, that um, I had kept that were rough, rough, because sometimes I like to keep that just as sort of a sort of a kind of a library to look at stuff that I've done. So I'm just going to open up this box and see what I pull out of here. And it's pretty random. Um, but oh, I found something really interesting. Now, this is, if you don't know, I worked on a movie called Brother Bear. I was an animator on CODA. Um, if you don't know, everyone out there, I, I started in animation in 1990. I was an intern with Disney Animation then. And... From that point on, I've been in animation uh, for nearly 30 years now. So, but the first 14 of those years, I was at Disney. So my first career ever in the industry for 14 years was working at Disney as a cleanup artist, as an animator and a character designer, and um, eventually later on became a story artist. But uh, I just have all of this stuff. It, I mean... All of my friends out there, Tim Hodge and Aaron and uh, everyone that's that's worked at Disney, you know, a lot of us have these like random boxes of stuff that we kind of just put away for our kids or our grandkids uh, just as something to have as sort of an heirloom. But first thing I just pulled up out of my box is storyboards by a well-known artist. All right. His name is Rune Beneke Brandt. He'll probably be like, oh my God, why are you showing these? But I just found this. And these are, these are thumbnail of visual development for Brother Bear. These were sketches that um, he, was, he was having fun with. Uh, just doing some storyboard exploration of bears. And uh, it's it's nothing in particular, but it's it's something where he I believe I'm, I'm trying to remember this time what he was doing with this, but he was taking this, and he was just doing story exploration so that he can start boarding and animating or actually animating the character because he actually animated. If you don't know, some of the best animation in Brother Bear was the mom, uh, uh, the mother. She plays a short role in the film, but probably some of the most realistic and, and amazing animation done by the famous Rune Beneke Brandt, who uh, was my comrade in arms. He was a good, he is a good friend of mine, or um, we haven't spoken in a while, but um, as always, you know, when you don't see each other forever, it doesn't mean you don't, you're not friends. It's just, we're off doing different things. So I think he's at Netflix. 
head of story on a production over there. So he's doing well. So I'm gonna pull out another thing. Here's, uh, oh, I got, a, I got a hi from Mexico, Cesar, C Cesar Falcon. Hello, hello. Uh, I got Miss Rocket Greeley. Hello, Blaze, hello to you. This is awesome. So um, yeah, I've, uh, Kirk Michael says, yeah, you got a lot. Uh, I've got bags full of rough art crap. Yes, so do I. Okay, so so to, uh, so another thing is um, one of the other films that I worked on was a film called Lilo and Stitch, and <clears throat> a lot of people, a lot of my students, and other people have asked like, what is your favorite film that you've worked on in terms of uh, as a character animator? And I would say for me, hands down, it was working on Lilo and Stitch, and primarily it was is it was fun because. Um, I got to work with one of the best animators out there named Alex Cooper Schmidt, uh, who this just this past year, the, this year, turned 60. Happy belated. And Alex um, really was a good mentor of mine and taught me a lot, but he also gave me a lot of like free reign. Um, he allowed me to do a lot of things that maybe other supervising animators wouldn't allow me to do. But he, 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 he was great because when I worked on Stitch, he gave me the opportunity to, to take any scenes that I wanted. It didn't matter if it was an A scene. It, it didn't matter for him. It was it was about sharing the wealth and it was about sharing the knowledge of, of that he he has brought to the table. And um, he didn't need to keep all the best scenes. He he allowed everyone to have good scenes and on his crew, and which was which you know to me made a great a leader and a great supervising animator. But in the middle of all of doing animating Stitch. There was a moment in time when the story, now the story had been rewritten several times, but there was a moment in time when Stitch had a gang. And that gang was supposed to rescue him. But in order to rescue Stitch, he had to send, remember that ugly doll? Um, I don't know if I can find it. Maybe it's in this, this pile of stuff. Um, that The doll that um, Le uh, Lilo carries around. Well. The old story was that doll was to be turned into a robot by Stitch, and then he was going to jettison that that little doll off into space and send a message to his gang to come pick him up and rescue him. So for that short, short, I would say it probably lasted like a month, I uh, was going to supervise three characters. I was going to uh, head up the doll, the little doll that was gonna be animated and jettisoned out. And then I was also gonna be doing two of the other characters, uh, which was part of his gang. And um, Bucka and Chim, I, I'm not exactly sure what the names they had come up with, but so I just wanted to share with you just one sketch of what could have been but never did become was this guy here. This is, this was one of the, would have been one of, uh, Stitch's gang members, but um, unfortunately he never came to pass. He is actually, if you look at that little guy up there, I had designed him so that, that those arms that are stretching out over in the shoulders, um, if you see that smiley face, that's a doorway, and basically it's a little guy that's in a big suit uh, that has a sort of a symbiotic relationship, and he, he's a little guy that kind of gets in the suit and becomes this massive dude. And then the other gang member was this guy. This was the other sidekick. Now this guy here, um, I kind of loosely named uh, character after me because at the time I had this weird like blonde surfer cut and I was also very nasally all the time. So I figured this was a character that was constantly having allergies like to everything. So he has uh, his nasal drippage going back into his suit, which uh, I don't know why, but maybe that's his, his way of breathing and uh, getting his nutrients. But either way, um, I designed that character, and this was uh, mid to late 90s, right? When uh, we were working on this film, so that there you go. So that was pretty random, and then, oh, wow. And then I found this, this one. 
Uh, Jordan Katsubu. Hey, Jordan! And Sammy Clayton says, hey, from South Africa, Africa, super cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Jordan, hey, I was about to call you, Jordan, if you wanted to get online. Um, so uh, this is just like, all right, this is 1997 because I see the date on this. And um, if any of you guys know uh, Mulan, I was an animator in Mulan and I animated uh, a lot of the Huns and some of uh, Shan Yu. But the lead for the Huns and Shan Yu was Press Ramanillis. Now, Press Ramanillis unfortunately passed away uh, much, much, much too young. He, he had passed away from leukemia and fought a good fight. But um, it's always nice, and I literally forgot that I had this. Um, we, when we were in our studios, we always had these character offs, like um, pretend, you know, we would do characters of each other just for fun. And sometimes they got really down and dirty. Like we would just, it would be our way of like, just, you know, just kind of calling each other out. So, um, and especially for birthdays, one of the things that we loved getting was, was um, drawings from everyone. So I, I literally have, a box somewhere out, out here, like tons and tons of just drawings of people that have done of me over the years during my birthday, because I loved that. And I've kept all that stuff. Eventually one day I'll have it framed, but I think in this particular case, I might frame this one because, and I literally had this haircut, but this was during working on Mulan, uh, not or just finishing up Mulan. And this was uh, a, a caricature that Press Ramanillis did of me. Now Press was the supervisor again on, on Mulan, or on, on Shan Yu. And so this was a caricature that he did of me on animation paper, our 16 field, uh, which was awesome animation paper. And I actually think he's using the old pencils <clears throat> that Glenn Keane and them had. I, there's this, uh, particular pencil that everyone loved using. I don't know, in 97, I don't know if we ran out of those pencils at that point or if he was using Tomboy. But uh, uh, this is this is actually really, really cool to find this because um, I forgot I even had it. But that's, that's me at, let's see, 97, I would have been 27 years old. So that's a 27-year-old character of Travis Blaze. So holding my animation. So there you go. That's pretty cool. I love that. That's awesome. Anyways. Ah, memory lane, memory lane, memory lane. So, oh, and I'll, oh, one more. Let's see here. Oh, gosh, this is all really good stuff, too. Gosh, man. The things that you find, um, this little, little Chris Sanders sketch, uh, this is a Xerox, this is a copy. This isn't an original, unfortunately, but that's a storyboard sketch from from the movie. And then, of course, uh, Life Fantasy says, this is all so amazing. Well, thank you. Um, I'm happy to chat anytime. Uh, okay, Jordan, I might call you in a little bit. So, uh, other things that, you know, I'm a teacher, um, besides working in industry, which um, I'm currently doing, uh, not now, but will after this. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people ask us um, as animators and, and story artists, uh, do you do you continually draw and practice outside of you know your normal day, day to day? And the answer would be yes. I <clears throat> I kind of for me I kind of eat, sleep, and dream about creative development, animation, drawing, and sketching. It's probably a bad thing I don't know it's kind of an obsession but um, it's also a continual education as being an artist and being on films I think one of the best things about being in film production TV or animation whatever production it is it's the research it's the development process which I find uh, really fascinating but I also find incredibly educational because every production I go on to is is new it's different um, so this one, this was stuff, uh, I'm trying to remember why we, we pulled this out. 
Um, but this is old animation drawings from, from a Glenn Keane lecture. And these are actual model sheets uh, that they distributed and gave out to everybody. And I believe this is Glenn Keane's talking about uh, structure of dogs and animal anatomy. And um, it just goes through uh, line of actions. It goes through drawing points on how to draw a dog. Um, you can see that there. And then it's, it goes into uh, attitude, which is pretty awesome. Um, attitude, I think this is just a general um, group of model sheets that I had from when we were just learning how to do stretch and squat. Oh, which leads up to our perfect uh, thing today that I'm going to talk about, which is stretch and squash. So there's a little thing that I have here. I'll hold it up like that. That Glenn, Glenn did of stretching and squash. Oh, wow. This is so cool. Honestly, guys, I forgot I had all this stuff. Uh, animating a four, four footed creature. He's got, I've got all kinds of stuff, comparative anatomy. But um, these are just things that I've, I've kept in my arsenal. And, um, you know, it was all part of my education. My bridge, you know, you got, the, you got your walk cycle. Uh, this is actually a walk or a can. This might be a canter. I'm not sure. Uh, it looks like it might be a canter. But at any rate, um, and it just goes through, after that, it just goes through different types of MyBridge images that are poorly Xerox copied. Um, but it's great to have in your box of stuff. Like I said, I've got five or six of these boxes laying around that I, we could probably just spend hours and hours. I mean, I've got, you know, copies of, of Jungle Book, which is pretty cool. Again, more, more animation movement. Oh, and it was tied in with, look at that, that's pretty cool. This is again copies that we we all of us would get these for inspiration. These are early exploration shots. See, this even says for reference only. So, oh, what does it say? Property of. Well, these are things again. Like I said, we we all of us as animators and artists have kept uh, for ourselves for reference, and we've kept it over the years. So. Can those be published in a book so I can buy it? No, those cannot be published. Anything that I show you is is pretty much the Disney property. So those things can't be published. Those things can't be used. But I do at some point plan on putting together my own little arsenal of, of uh, drawings and tutorials that I'm, I'm trying to put together now. So which leads me into, let me switch over to my transition here Let's see Cintiq and transition leads me to stretch and squash so I kind of wanted to go in here today and, and I figured what might be interesting is if you guys you guys wanted to just draw along with me so one of the things um, you saw early on that I put a tutorial out called the bouncing ball test um, I'm putting another back to basics tutorial with uh, dealing with the flower sack and why that matters and that will be coming out in the next day or so but um, all of those uh, and particularly even the flower sack um, all of those part of exploration of animation is learning the proper stretch and squash uh, whenever you're working with any type of animated character whether it's 2d or 3d um, so one of the first rules about stretching and squashing that I have learned is Every design that you do, every character that you draw, um, and in this case, I think I was going to draw, uh, use my character Trax. Uh, so I've got this character named Trax. And Trax has got one pupil with two, uh, one, one, one iris, I guess, with two pupils in, within it. And he's, he's got sort of, he's, he's got sort of a potato a fat potato sack kind of vibe going to him and he's got this tail 
that kind of breaks up like this into three parts. Um, and he's got these these kind of short, stubby legs that um, have like square like graphic shapes that are like hand feet. Um, and then I've got um, his arms, which are also kind of similar to his, his uh, legs. And uh, he also has like this stubby arms but he also has these patterns on him which is sort of loosely Aboriginal based idea um, this is a character that I have had over the many years um, and I'm currently trying to turn him after I think I've, I've had this idea of probably for the last 11 ish years or so um and the idea is i'm turning him the the show's called wangle and i want to turn this into a short series first and so I'm, i have a script that i've been working on and i am trying to fine tune it but i thought um and you may have seen him there's there's a uh a t an animation test i did of him falling using the calipeg um app and um I was using that to sort of give, um, to test out the app and also to see if I can use the app in a pipeline uh, for this this particular production. So the idea is, is that I would create a whole entire uh, mini series, like a short series, uh, one minute to three minute short series of Wangle, the sort of little interstitials, just to kind of uh, tell these little short stories uh, of being in the dream world. and. Wangle, the main character, is a dream guide, and Trax is his sidekick, and Trax is sort of the tracker, um, hence the name Trax. He, he knows when the next dream is about to unfold, because his all of his, uh, everything, all of his stripes and patterns start to glow. Um, so this is sort of the character that I've drawn and uh, designed. Uh, this is what sort of what he looks like from the side. You're gonna if you're gonna draw him, he's kind of got this sort of shape. Oh, and he's got these ears that kind of flop around in the back. And so one of the things is is before you get into stretching and squashing is asking yourself what does what type of character are you animating uh, what type of character are you designing and um, what type of world does he live in meaning is his world um, very cartoony like acme uh, like looney tunes is there a lot of stretch and squash or is he more realistic like let's say prince of egypt um, where um, if you look at um, the illusionist, the illusionist is very like almost illustrated animation, and so there's a very there's there's a there's rules to every world that you you kind of create and uh, develop within, and that determines how much squash and stretch and um, exaggeration you can do to your character. So the first thing is always asking yourself what is what is the world that this character lives in and what are what are my limitations to that to that character so I'm just drawing these guys really him super super loose um, so this would be wangle or I'm sorry tracks I, I name him tracks like this tracks with an X so tracks again is a, a character um, that is part of my dream guide world. Uh, he's a dream guy. He's a sidekick to the dream guide, but he's in this this series. So I'm going to take him, and I'm going to let's see. I'll just do a little gray underneath him real quick, and 
just so you can see how I've got the patterns. He's a, he's sort of a blue gray uh, character uh, in in design. I'm just gonna keep it black and white. But uh, in terms of his shape, language, and his look, um, so you can draw along with me. Everything else is uh, is gonna be like a white color. His pupils, his stripes. Just so you can get an idea, is us. You got some more spots here and there. But this character is tracks. So you can see how that starts to come to life a little bit once you start adding color to it. So we're going to do a little stretch and squash animation with this guy. Um, so let me let me block it out for you here. Let's let's break him down. So we're gonna do a little stretch and squash today. So again, one of the things that I talk about for stretching and squashing is is knowing what your character. Uh, let's see here. I'm just looking over here because every now and again I gotta look at the, the questions. Uh, Geralia says that's your old stuff is pure gold for us beginners. I would also buy it. Yes, thank you very much. And Kirk Michael goes. Uh, goes is tracks a cyborg tracks is not a cyborg so this whole world that I've created is dream time uh, they live in this dream time world let's see if I can pop something up real quick here um, just so you can get a sense of who tracks is um, and the world so imagine dream time and I posted this of tracks falling um, which you may have seen before that it is that I posted on all my, my social media. Uh, back to basics. See, I'm gonna find, where are you? Wangle. So, this, oh, gotta make him smaller. This is Wangle. All right, so this guy is shaped out of a boomerang, uh, and again another, and he he does a lot. He this world is incredibly cartoony, so you can stretch these guys, you can squash them as hard as you want, you can cut them in half. They'll always come back together. It's a dream time world where anything can happen. So I wanted to create um, two characters. Well, he he's going to be relatively stiff in terms of the body shape because. He's a boomerang, so I wanted to have some flexibility, but he's also incredibly animated. So a lot of the, the exaggerated animation is going to happen in his hands. It's going to happen in his hair. He's got this bright red hair that flops around all over the place, and he's always happy. This guy is always, like, he's got the on button stuck on on forever. And then you've got Trax, which is sort of the balance to him, which is who I'm drawing now. And Trax is his sidekick, who is this sort of down to earth, more grounded character who's more, he, who's sort of the voice of reason. Um, living in a world where anything can happen, he also has fears and certain little, little idiosyncrasies, like he hates falling dreams. Um, he doesn't, he reluctantly goes on these dreams because he knows that nine times out of ten, tracks or Wangle's going to get them into trouble within these dreams, and he's going to have to figure out a way to help get him out of it. So, that's, that's kind of um, a, a short explanation of the character. So in these particular characters, stretching and squashing is going to be widely used. Um, so just let's block out let's block out the tracks character first so you can maybe draw along with me. So when I think of tracks, I think of tracks as sort of like this the, sort of a, a triangular sh shape, right? I just kind of treat his idea of him as a series of triangles even his even his uh, tail is a series of triangles 
and that's that's sort of how I started coming up with this character is like looking at shapes and going, oh, you know, this triangle might be an interesting shape for him or a cone. You know, if you look at a cone or a series of cones, that's the underneath part. And then you stick a you stick a circle on top. And you know, if, if that was there and his other arm was there. So I, I think of these as a series of triangular triangles and cones. You know, straight sh this type of shape. So that's what I started with when I was thinking of this character, because I already had a character that had this sort of boomerang shape feel and I wanted something to kind of contrast that um, so I created something squattier and, and more ground grounded hence why he's more of a grounded character um, I literally had him more bottom heavy um, for that reason and then the in terms of Wangle I literally thought of Wangle as a shape it started he started off as a boomerang you know I started thinking oh wow okay um, I'm, I'm being inspired by Aboriginal Dreamtime. I, I want to create my own little Dreamtime world, and I want to have a dream guide, like like more of a Western philosophy thinking, where you have a, a, a dream guide that comes in, uh, even Native American, where you have yeah, you, your dream guides come in and, and sort of guide you through your dream. This is Wangle. He is that character. So with that shape, I wanted to have a boomerang shape because the idea behind the boomerang was no matter how, when you throw the boomerang, no matter where you throw it, the idea is the boomerang, no matter how far away it goes, it always comes back. And that's the thing about him. He's very circular in his ideas, and he always comes back home in the end. He never gets lost. He might go explore, but he always comes back. So I had that sort of already ingrained in my head of, of, of sort of his shape language. So if I take this character and I knock, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it down here. And I knock this back a little bit. So, are you guys following me so far? Yes, Aborigines and Dream Time. Um, so, if you zoom into this, I literally would take that design right there, let's do it in black, and just based on that, the shape that I just did, I can go in. And I can put in my my drawing very simply, very easily. Uh, and I've got his pupils. I always like to make maybe make one pupil slightly bigger than the other, and it's usually the one that's sort of maybe closest to you. Like if he's turned a little bit, this will be slightly bigger, and this will be slightly smaller. Let me take a sip of coffee. So I want to make sure that we're still, you can still see this. All right, we'll zoom in a little bit more on this guy and bring him over here so you can see that. So based on this character, um, which is a series of triangles and cones, um, I, can, I can kind of sculpt in uh, the character wing, uh, tracks. So... He's got his knee, he's got his foot there. There we go. There we go. All right. So here we go. So then I can I can have his mouth. His mouth is sort of shaped, and he's Aboriginal, um, in idea of design, um, but it's completely just sort of inspired by that because I really have a, a fascination with Aboriginal myth mythology in general. But it's not a direct derivative of it because I didn't want to um, offend that culture. Uh, but I wanted to create a world as if. Dreamtime was for everybody, and not just um, 
in Aboriginal uh, Australian belief systems, uh, but if it was also something that was, you know, a belief system that was transcending throughout the world, what would that look like in my my mind? What would Dreamtime look for me? Um, so I started sort of designing uh, this world, this just fun fan fantasy world where anything can happen. Um, Dreaming big is, is is the way of life. Oh, I just heard a dog. Sounds like my dog's trying to get into that into the room here. So I've got the tail right there, and now I am going to uh, probably bring this down a little bit, bring his hands, just so you can kind of see what his arms look like. They're stretched out. There we go. Erase this a little bit. So this that would be a th sort of a three quarter uh, down shot of uh, tracks. It's got a circle here, circle there, circle there, circle there. Um, now animating this guy is gonna be a, a bit of a challenge just because of all of my uh, separate patterns that I have on here. But overall, I think the way he's designed is pretty symmetrical. There's a lot of reference points to use. So animating him I think will be fun uh, to animate the general shape of him and then adding in the, the details like the like these it, they're actually really nice points of reference in terms of um, where his, his bends are where this this you know he'd have a bend there he'd have a bend here oh let's see here oh I got an, I got a couple of new subscribers to YouTube yay so if you're following along with me and you're drawing this is tracks and so we've talked about first determining the world that this character is going to be living in. Once you've determined the world that it's living in, whether it's a realistic Prince of Egypt or whether it's a, um, and even within those worlds, um, you may have things that are more stretchy and squashy. Uh, like for instance, um, Aladdin, did have stretch and squash, but the really most stretchy and squashy character in that whole entire thing was the genie. Um, the least amount of stretch and squash you would see would be the villain, per se. Um, you did have a sense of stretch and squash in all of that animation, but certain characters tend to lend itself more to, to that stretch and squash appeal. Now, stretching and squashing doesn't mean just cartoony either. Uh, stretching and squashing is a matter of like constricting like if you had um, let's say a, a dog's front leg and this is, let's say this is a, 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 a four leg now a squash could literally mean just squashing foot like this or the forearm like this the foreleg for a squash right so you know you've got you got this pose and you've got this sort of squash pose or it could mean stretching like this So you've got you've got variances of different types of stretch and squash that will always occur. Um, so the type of stretch and squash for tracks can be I mean tracks can flatten to a pancake, 
and he can stretch a mile long. Those are his extremes, right? Those are the things. But in a re even in the realistic, more realistic animation of character designing and animating, um, stretch and squash will always refer to a, a, a compression of something and an and a, a non-compression is stretching out of something. Whether it's an arm, whether it's my face squinching down and doing that, there that's a, that's a squash and a stretch. Ah, That would be the extreme for me as a realistic person, my stretch and squash. So stretch and squash is always occurring in realistic animation as well, but not in the extremes as tracks would be. So um, stretching and squashing really works well when you're doing like run cycles of dogs or fast runs or fast walks or where you might have a realistic character. But when you see slow motion, even like let's say a cheetah, um, cheetahs have like, you wouldn't believe how much compression and stretching that they actually occur because of how flexible their body is. So even in the natural world, they can really stretch and squash themselves quite a bit. And just exaggerating on that idea alone when you go into animation gives it that much more of an impact. So again, uh, knowing your character, knowing the world, what it's, what it's in. Uh, let me, I like to darken this character up. Let's see here. Looks like I drew, did I draw? Yep, I drew it right there, perfect. All right, so I'm going to add just another layer just so we can have this in color. Because I like to throw these things in color just so I can see it better. Okay, so you've got um, stretch and squash. You've got tracks here, three quarter down. Um, I've sort of loosely described how he's drawn. Um, think of a, a series of cones or triangles um, that you can you can build upon. And I mean, I can do pretty much any angle based on that idea. I can have that character pretty much be. Because I've designed him very simply, um, the the most the most complex thing about this character is probably the the stripes, his patterns on him. Uh, and I didn't even draw the back side of him to kind of show you. He's got a he's got sort of a bullseye on his back of on his back, and that's sort of a, a metaphor for basically he's he gets the br he's the brunt of all everything that happens in in this short series. So um, typically, you know. If they gotta lure a, a, a nightmare creature into to get to get them out of a bad dream, um, he's gonna be the bait. That's that's the kind of character he is. So I can drop him there, and then again, this world that I created for him, I wanted him to be more. Um, fantastical and cartoony and also I'm designing him so that many people can be able to draw him like I think anyone could could easily be able to start sketching this character uh, if they wanted to which I'm hoping you guys are doing so let me see here um, any questions out there so far I can imagine tracks walking like a duck with a waddle question mark because of his short legs and big round torso yeah, I actually have some animation of him that I did draw, uh, so I can kind of show you before we get into the stretch. Uh, let's see, where would I find his animation? Oh, and I would say this, just so you have reference, this is, uh, I showed this earlier, and at some point I'm gonna do a live feed of this too, um, is I created, I had a guy named Danny Samuels um, I art directed and designed this this set that I wanted him to build, and he he was a he's a builder, a set designer, and he designed this treehouse for me, um, and this is sort of like the 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 rough sketch that I sent him, 
uh, before we actually did it. And this is Wangle's home. So um, this is the world. Again, I'm showing you this in, in relationship to Trax and Trax's world and where he lives and sort of the, the look and feel of what I'm going for. Very fantasy, very fun, uh, very colorful, lots of patterns, uh, which makes the complexity a little bit a little bit more challenging when it comes to 2D animation. But it's a world that I really feel like could lend itself to a lot of fun and exciting things to happen. So this is one, these are a couple of iterations that I drew of uh, the one on the left um, was one idea. The one on the right is the one I ended up going with. And then um, see if we, and these were earlier concepts. I really liked the one on the left However, the one on the left is a little bit complicated. So I ended up going with something simpler, which was that, that design. So let's see if I can find some, I'm gonna look up and see if I can find some tracks animation. Over here, just so you can kind of see a little reference of what I did um, before. I might not be able to find any of him in particular. Um, but we'll just keep moving forward and I'll, I'll see if I can find it a little bit later. So any questions? Uh, oh, Kirk Michael says, love that house. Um, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to see if, uh, Jordan's going to call. See, I'll, I'm going to see if I can call Jordan. Jordan, are you still out there? Um, let's see here. I like this doing random calls to people. Why not? Let's see, Jordan, if you know, Jordan has helped me many, many times on this uh, live feed. Um, I'm going to call him right now, see if he's out there. He may not answer. Jordan. Jordan. He may not answer. Oh, he did answer. Hey, man. Hey. You're live. You're with me. Live. What's going on? So I'm doing this live feed. I was watching you. I'm doing this live feed on Stretch and Squash, and so I thought I would maybe, because um, you you always have good questions, and I was wondering. So we're doing. I'm doing this tracks character right now, um, which you were seeing earlier on the live feed, and wondering if you had any any suggestions or questions because I move forward. I, I'm talking about. Uh, knowing the world, knowing the character design, um, and what where that character is going to live, so you know how much you can stretch and squash a character. Yeah, um, yeah. The, one of the biggest questions I always have for myself when I'm animating is. And by the uh, way, Jordan's an animator as well, not just a story artist, but an animator. I, I try to sometimes. Um, <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, the biggest thing I'm asking myself. Uh, a lot of the times uh, in the world that they live in uh, also kind of what what kind of mass do they have like how close to jello is a character and how close to solid rock is a character um, that's an interesting way to look at look at that okay yeah it, it's always super super easy like my, my tendency is to always exaggerate it to always make something like jello you know just because it it makes it fun to have all that secondary like uh, bounce in it, but sometimes it, that doesn't work. So I always do the the rock to jello comparison. Um, but how do you kind of gauge like the weight within that squash and stretch? Um, so if I want a character, let's say like like tracks, that's sort of he's he's bottom heavy. Um, I'm always thinking. The, the, um, I'm going to draw him right now, sort of like this, this cone shape. Um, this part down here, his butt, his, um, his lower end is going to be more like uh, a, a kettleball. You know, you know what kettleballs, you know those, those kettleballs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I know that for him, a lot of, a lot of his body is going to lead with his lower part. So when he's running, he might be running um, more with his, his belly out forward as, and as, uh, I don't know if you're online right now, if you can see this or not, but I'm, I'm drawing. I am. It's, it's a little delayed, yep. but 
just by a few seconds. So so basically, um, all my weight is going down. Everything in terms of this character is going down. So when I even when I stretch or, or if, if he's running, I'm also thinking that this this area in here is going to be the heaviest part. So I, you know, and you can also think about that stretch and squash like the bouncing ball idea. And this is where a lot of his bounce and flexibility is going to come from. And his upper body is going to be more doing a lot of overlapping action. Just because he's very cartoony and, and, and flexible. Um, this, this, this area from probably here to here. Uh, can stretch quite a bit and um, so for him I'm always thinking in terms of animating this character is always gonna be bottom heavy so no matter what he does um, I'm gonna I'm going to think in those terms so that it will affect logically how I'm um, figuring out the animation for him do you do kind of less squash and stretch um, the closer to the bone it would be? Uh, ex I'm, I'm not following on that one. Say that one more time. Like, closer, like, you know, his face has less fat on it and stuff, right? Because the it's kind of squashed to the, uh, or hugging the skeleton, right? Yeah, he, um, he this character... If wider something gets, it would probably do more bounce, right? Yeah, this character is like, um... His pupil is like his skull, you know. Like his his literally his pupil that it uh, is and his eyes. It's this one eyeball that sits on top, and he really has no neck. Um, yeah. It just sort of becomes part of the the overall shape of his uh, his character. Um, so when I stretch, if I'm going to stretch this character out really far. I'm going to probably stretch a lot in here, um, stretch, and almost like the, the ball is, the ball is sort of, uh, the last thing that happens. So if he gets, if he stretches out really far going shooting that way, this is sort of like a, becomes like a release. Like if he stretches out and then he, and the ball bounces in and comes crashing in on him. Um, he, he might. I lost you there, Travis. Oh, you lost me? Sorry, I, I lost you there for a little bit. My network is a little messy, so I apologize to oh. your audience. No, it's uh, okay. It's all right. Um, yeah. but, but these are good questions to ask, ask me in terms of uh, the weight and feel. So like I was saying up here, I don't know if you can still see that, Jordan, but like yeah. uh, if he's stretching out this way and it's almost like his body kind of catches up and shoots towards him and then so there's a little like undulation of stretch and squash happening because his his bottom part is always going to be like sort of the weighted factor like if i throw a hacky sack or something that's bottom heavy it's always gonna you're gonna have this sort of like trail leading behind and it just <clears throat> smack that's sort of who who tracks is in terms of like his weight so if he bounces and squashes his legs might fly up uh, and he might squash down uh, with his tail. That's awesome. You know, um, and the but he'll always he'll always re recoil. You know, back up yeah. and settle. So I'm always thinking in that shape. So when I get to my stretch and squash, um, I know that. If I think of a ball in a in a potato sack, in an empty potato sack, um, let's say this is a, a potato sack and there's a ball in it, and I, you throw that ball. What's what's you know what's what's going to happen 
with that ball when it, it's stretching, it's being shot out of something. This thing's sort of going to be trailing behind it. And that's, and that's sort of how I kind of see um, tracks being in terms of his character. So, anyways, I just wanted to call you, see if you asked cool. me any questions. Okay. Um, um, at some point, I want to get Jordan back over here once once we get through this this COVID nineteen situation. Uh, Jordan's how are you guys doing over there? By the way, Jordan. Jordan lives up here with me, but we have not been able to hang out because of this whole situation. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we live maybe ten minutes away, and uh, it feels like basically we all live hundreds of miles apart at this point. Um, it, it's so true. And, and yeah. I'm like, I'm but sure it's like that with everyone. We're holding up well. I think it helps to have roommates because you don't get so lonely. Um, and uh, we're right by the park as well with lots of trails. So I don't have to be around people, but can still get outside. Yep. Um, That's the but, same with uh, us. Yeah, we're just doing our best. I'm keeping busy. I got several freelance jobs and it's the upside to doing things that are digital content is everybody is in right now and so a lot of ple people are you know playing games and watching content online so i feel fortunate in the industry that i work in because there's plenty of work still yes um, that's and my hope that, that continues well my my hope hope and as i said with everybody else out there is that you know, you and I, we've worked remotely for a while now and hoping that this opportunity um, that we have where we're all working remotely will uh, allow studios to kind of consider the idea of other artists out there that may have not had an opportunity to work in my industry um, to possibly be considered to work in this industry if they create a pipeline that actually works where people can work remotely on a more full-time basis. Yeah. Um, I know everything's thinking this is a temporary situation, but you know it isn't for for somebody like me or for somebody like Jordan. It's and and Aaron. It's not. Um, it's a full time thing for us. So you know we we uh, manage ourselves in, in such a way that allows us uh, to have people have confidence in our work and what we can do because we, um, you know, I I can tell you this right now, Chocho, -Cho, my my partner, she's. She's working from home now, and she, she doesn't know what to do with herself half the time because she's not used to uh, the freedoms that we've had, and uh, we've had to force ourselves to structure um, ourselves to be um, diligent about doing our work and not procrastinating and going, oh, I can do this tomorrow, or you know, those are I think the big the big struggles that we have as as freelancers is being uh, time management. Would you say would be a big factor? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And in, in some ways, a lot of it is like, hey, I got to get away from my desk. I got to, like, not work so hard right now. I need to, to give myself a break. Um, that's part of the time management, too. And you can, you can get yourself sucked in, like, right now with the, the day lasting longer. It's like 6.30 in the evening. I'm, I feel like it's like 3.30 and I have to force myself to walk away from my desk, you know? Oh yeah, um, I have. I'm constantly trying to do that, um, but I always fail miserably. I always end up. It's hard. I always end up leaving my desk at like one or two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And go. Oh, I have to go to bed. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if um, I, while we've been sitting here and, and talking about this, um, I was sort of illustrating those those points of like the potato sack, right? That I have here. Yeah. And how I can apply it to. To wangle, or I'm sorry, tracks, um, and so I've I've sort of done a draw over of that one potato sack right here. I know you're gonna get a delay, and then what tracks would look like over that. So that's really awesome. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, listen, I'm gonna keep drawing. Thank you very much, sir. And yeah, uh, good luck with the rest of the video today. Oh, we've got it. We got a, a thing from someone, uh, John Stevenson says, I freelanced a while now, so it's not new, but there is more stress from not being able to go to the store or anything, which which used to be break time for me. Sure. Yeah. That's very true. <laughs> that is that is definitely, I think, part of the issue. And also the fact that if you're like with like Jordan 
or like me, who's you're with somebody, um, you kind of you can't go out together either. So yeah. you know, when we go shopping, um, I'm sure it's like that with you guys. One person from the household usually goes um, to kind of minimize the the contact that we have because we know that going into a grocery store, they're not practicing social distancing still. Um, and uh, here they're doing it a lot more now. Um, but you know, I talked to my brother Aaron, and you know, they're everyone's out like it's no big deal. And that could, that may or could be one of the worst hard and hit places if they don't start practicing what we're doing here. So, um, anyways, enough being said. Let's keep going with the stretch and squash stuff. I'll talk to you later, Jordan. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good one. All right. Cheers. See ya. Jordan's a great guy. Very, very, very talented. Um, so, stretching and squashing. Uh, Jordan brought up some questions about how I approach uh, the weight of a character uh, for stretching and squashing. So, well, this is a good example if you take, if we did, I'll, I'll start with a, a fresh new one here. And I'll get uh, my onion skin off. And so... If I just loosely start doing shape language and I uh, like a potato sack, and we think of that, think of a ball, right? And think of a potato sack. All right, so you got this ball. You got a potato sack. Now you put, you put the ball. In the potato sack right and so your balls in there now imagine throwing like I said throwing the ball and how does that that um, potato sack sort of react to that ball. You know, the force of it going that way. And if I if I do um, a lot of these these ideas of this sort of stretch and sort of squash of the potato sack idea with the ball in it. Right, and it's it's squashing down, uh, bending over. Now, if I was to take this idea of the stretching and squashing, we'll do one more, um, and I'll just do a random shape uh, like this. And he's falling falling down that way. Um, I can take this idea I'm just adding a little tail because uh, Trax does have a tail to it. Now I can take any of these this random shape and then I can start applying uh, Trax to it. And that's one of that's one one way to approach. Once you have a good uh, shape language to your character, then it's about just figuring out where your stretching and squashing is. Don't worry about the details first. Just worry about getting the the shapes in nice. Said, so, hey Travis, nice work. People here in Connecticut are also are, aren't taking it serious. Yeah, uh, Julio. Yeah, I, I Julio. Sorry, is it Julio or Julio? Julio. I would say. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, yeah, people need to take this thing seriously. The COVID-19 uh, is, you know, uh, we said hello to my dad earlier today. Um, we haven't gotten um, a full, uh, we haven't gotten uh, an, a definite from the doctor, but my dad was touch and go there for a while. Last couple of days got super, super sick. And um, if it wasn't COVID, it was damn near something near it because he was he was not in good shape. But 
Marshall is a trooper. He's a fighter, and he came out of it. And so now uh, they're just waiting to see if, if the test results came back positive. But this is a serious thing, and it, and it affects especially you know us at our age when we have parents like my dad who's 80. Um, these things do affect them. Um, and we're also seeing it in, in other people that have compromised uh, immune systems. Like our good friend Brian Johnson, his son has cystic fibrosis. And, you know, I'm constantly thinking about how his son's doing. Uh, it's times like that. And he's only 14, 15 years old. And, you know, he is incredibly compromised uh, with situations like this. So we have to think about others. We have to not think of ourselves and think about those people that um, just think about all your friends or friends of friends that may have um, people that have compromised Im immune uh, situations. And they may not be your friend of a friend. Now imagine though you have COVID and you don't know it and you're you're hanging out with somebody and that person hangs out with somebody. It's like five degrees separations of Kevin Bacon. At some point, it's going to get to Kevin Bacon, right? So we have to eliminate that 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 process for as long as we can to to help minimize the overall problems that can occur when we have pandemics. So enough of that. Back to this. So. I can take these shapes that we have currently and I can start adding uh, just right over that I can start adding my character actually I'm going to do that in black and I can start just over the existing This is his mouth. I know I'm going to have his mouth stretch as well. His tongue. He doesn't really have teeth, although he'll have teeth when he says certain vowel sounds and stuff like that. I can put teeth in him. But for the most part, you don't really see any teeth. Um, and I can literally start. Adding. legs, his feet. Now he can have structure when he's running. He can have structure when he's uh, grabbing at something or, or bringing his legs up. I mean, he does, you know, he does have a, a semblance of some sort of bone structure underneath him. Um, let's see here. So you can see just by doing these shapes, I can start adding um, my details to this character uh, as my last part of this posing of the character for his stretching and squashing. So got that and then when he when he squashes down right here you know his his eyes can he does have a he can blink his eyes um, he also has a little extra design in there that I didn't add um, but seeing his backside for the first time he has sort of a circle circular pattern it goes on the back like that. And so I'm literally, when I'm designing a character or this, or any character for that matter, um, at some point, once I got confident in his shape language, that's when I start um, really pushing, uh, I start exaggerating the shapes and seeing how far I can push this character before it doesn't look like the character anymore, before it looks like something weird. Um, so again, in order to do that, don't worry about the details that I'm doing now until last. So you're, I'm literally figuring out my shapes. Um, once I've done the gesture, once I've done the, the, the thing that I want to exaggerate. 
And I do lots and lots of these drawings. Some are good, some are bad, because I'm trying to find consistency in how I'm designing this character um, so that the more I do this practice, the more I start really pushing his, his shapes and figuring out what his limitations are, the better I'm gonna be able to animate. And this is a great warm-up exercise before you start storyboarding, before you start designing, before you start uh, uh, animating, is just start looking at these shapes and just start having fun stretching and squashing them and twisting them and doing things that you normally, um, that are just really simple and, and not be hung up on, on the details and then go in and add uh, what you need to with the design of the character. So again, what I'm doing is I'm going over the gesture that I just did, which was uh, the, this, these characters. And now I am coming in here and I can, again, quickly add my shapes to this. This is, at what point do you decide to do a smear? Oh, Chad Field says, at what point do you decide to do a smear? Now, that was a question. I don't know if, Chad, you brought that up to Aaron. Um, somebody had brought up about a smear during one of his live feeds uh, when he was doing a sneeze. Um, a, a smear happens when you're doing a fast action um, and you want to... It's so fast... Um, I think of a smear like this. All right. So you're limited how many frames you're going. So you can go to 60 to 90 to 120 frames per second. We typically stay within 24 frames to 30 frames per second is sort of our mid, our range when we're animating traditionally. So to make a fast action, meaning to get from point A to point B here really quick, rather than doing all the in-betweens and you want to get there fast, you do these smear drawings or you do these stretch drawings um, that exaggerate, that sort of fill in the gap of getting from point A to point B. And it's usually one drawing that snaps you into the next thing because you're trying to fill the gap between two extreme poses, but in a, in a way that makes it still feel animated and not limited and not poppy, not like it's like boom, boom, because you have a short amount of time to get there. Smear drawings is when that becomes in handy. So you've got to determine how fast is the character going. Uh, do, I, do I want the character uh, to get from point A to point B super fast or do I, you know, it's the speed in which you're doing your action will determine if you need to do a blur or not or a smear or not. So um, that's how I kind of determine things. Um, so I have Hassan Animator says, hey Travis Blaze, everybody. Every day I'm doing a self-practice, but don't have anyone to review my work. Really need feedback and instructions to know if I'm on the right, uh, right way or not. Thanks. Uh, with that being said to Hassan, um, once my, my, um, my new website gets launched, I am going to be building an online mentorship program for people that want to uh, get drawovers for people that want to learn how to be a better story artist, how to be a better character designer, how to be an animator, better storyteller. I'm going to be putting together uh, mentorship programs where it will allow us in small groups to get one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring. Now, it will come to as a cost because it's, it's part of me trying to uh, make this cost effective but also uh, allowing me to be able to continue to do this because everything I'm doing now is free um, because I feel like that's that's part of giving back. Um, but with, with regards to doing drawovers or regards to getting feedback and stuff like that, um, I'm going to be putting together programs. If, if, if there's an interest out there for people that want to have one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, feedback uh, when going through like a mentorship program like story or animation. So just know that that will be coming in the near future. This definitely this year. Um, anyways, so Going back to Chad Field uh, uh, question, what I can do is after I do this these drawings, I will start doing my little stretch and squash animation, and then I uh, I was talking about a little straight ahead, uh, and 
straight ahead animation, if people don't know it, is basically um, you're kind of freeforming how you're animating your character. Um, you're not pose to pose, which is like I start off with one pose here, you know, the character's, you know, reaching his hands out, and then maybe this is pose one, and then the next pose is uh, the character, you know, turns around. And looks down at something uh, and that would be like pose six and then uh, they they bend down to pick something up and I, I do these quick thumbnails that kind of especially this is would be tracks to kind of get this idea pick something up and then holds it up to the world whatever that object is now I'm posing this out, right? I'm posing this thing out. Um, I would say 16. And I'm figuring out where, where my general poses are. And then I'll go and I'll block this out and time it out in these general poses. Now that's pose to pose. That's blocking out, thumbnailing, and posing out animation That is um, that you're thinking out the choreography for. Straight ahead animation is sort of like um, I do a lot of it where I start with a drawing and I just I just start I know the action in my head that I want to have but I just dive into it and do it and I literally animate and time it out as I go and I'm literally doing it straight ahead I'm just doing one drawing after the next um, so I, I like to do straight ahead animation uh, because to me it's a great practice in um, figuring out my shapes so I one of the next things that I do when I'm doing stretching and squashing um, and figuring out shape language is I'll do I'll do some random straight ahead animation to kind of figure out is this character working or not and that's sort of how I approach um, part of the process of designing a character is having that straight ahead um, component into the the pipeline and how I'm developing something not everybody does that that's just specifically me I mean other people artists I'm sure do that but that's, that's something that's part of how I approach something that I know that I want to animate because everything I do is always going to end up getting animated, no matter what it is. And so I'm always thinking of how would this character be animated? How would this character look? I'm not just thinking of it as a one-off piece of art. I'm, I'm literally thinking of, of how I can turn this into some sort of animated thing that I can utilize. Um, Again, I'm going over these characters, uh, these shapes to build tracks. And now I've built, I've drawn this, this character and he's just fun for me. I, I just have a lot of fun uh, working this guy uh, because I, I just think he's, there's, he has so much, uh, there's just so much flexibility and, and cartooniness to him that appeals to me. And I also like to do my own characters. Um, I typically don't draw others because I like to just keep it original. Um, you know, if he's going to stretch, I can really stretch his, maybe even his eyes a little bit there. Maybe stretch his ears out a little bit. mouth there you go okay let's see why would some artists choose to, to straight ahead animation in a film thanks again uh, Kirk Michaels Travis do do you straight ahead when key poses only or key poses and breakdowns like instead of pose to pose um, you know the, the real I think I, I, you know and I could be thinking of this differently but the way I have always thought of straight ahead animation is like freeform drawing like freeform like I have the idea in my head and I just kind of go for it and um, and I'm gonna do that next after I do these stretches I'm just gonna do some freeform straight ahead animation and just think about what's off the top of my head um, so, uh, what was it, Chad? Why would some artists choose to do straight ahead animation in a film? Um, it depends on on their confidence level of what the action is. Um, you know, sometimes 
things are better. Uh, things can be animated faster if you just do it straight ahead because it's very random and it's it's sort of like I don't know. I I've done straight ahead animation for characters that are running across a screen, and they're just quickly running across the screen from point A to point B. I don't necessarily plot it out. I know that I have so much, more, so many frames that I need to get this character from point A to point B. And once I know that, I go, oh, I'll just, I'll just animate the character straight ahead and see how that happens. Um, because I, there's something about the randomness and the 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 less planned out aspect of it. It makes it feel a little bit more alive, I guess. Um, now. I, there's times when, because also other people, if you know how to animate something pretty confidently and you don't need, and you can time it out in your head, which is what I do a lot of times, um, then I'll do a lot of straight ahead animation because I'm literally timing and thinking about the character uh, uh, actions and movements. Um, and a lot of times the, my straight ahead animation is on ones. I do a lot of ones when it comes to that because I'm just having fun. Um, everyone has their own reasons why they do straight ahead animation. I I did a little bit of straight ahead animation when it came to um, oh a great a great scene the luau scene for Lilo and Stitch when uh, so I got I had dialogue I had to draw Lilo Stitch. Uh, 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 Jumba and Pleakley and they're all dressed Jumba's dressed you know as a tourist and then they're at the luau and then Pleakley's dressed in drag and uh, they're luring him with this chicken's chicken leg um, the moment he gets off the chicken the, the chair and Stitch is falling like I had to animate that entire scene um, the moment he I posed him out to get to the point where he grabs onto the chicken but the moment he grabs uh, Jumba grabs him um, I just did it all straight ahead I, I literally was just like I listened to the dialogue like 20 or 30 times there was so much going on so much interaction I, I literally played it and played it and played it and played it and played it back in my head so much until I had a video recording of it in my head and I just went for it and I literally just roughed out really loosely everything that needed to happen um, and I actually have those loose drawings somewhere in these boxes but then I went over and I, and I finessed it and tied it so my loose first pass was completely straight ahead because I needed to get that action out I needed to get that moment out in my head um, and I felt like if I planned it because it was spontaneous the the idea the motivation behind the acting was spontaneous you don't know what uh, Stitch is gonna do they don't know how Stitch is gonna react you know, Stitch grabs and bites his arm. You know, all of that is very random. I just sort of thought of that as I went. And because I wanted it to be feeling like it was spontaneous. And I think as a result, it turned out really well. Um, but that would be, um, once I did that, then I went back in and, and blocked things out. Now, the bad thing about doing straight ahead animation is, and cleanup artists hated me, is because I'm horrible at charting. Um, because I usually go just follow my drawings and do a key drawing and key drawing and do a general uh, general uh, chart and then just have people follow me up and then they had to figure a lot of stuff out because it was all in my artwork. Now that's not fun for for cleanup, uh, but for me as an artist, um, I sometimes they got uh, hard, charting was always like arduous for me. Um, but I enjoy, I mean, I realize now as I animate, charting how important it is, especially when you're breaking thing up, things up into partials and you need really clear indication of what is happening. So hopefully check out the luau scene uh, in Lilo and Stitch and watch that animation and you'll get a, a sense of what I'm talking about when you see from the point that uh, he has the chicken leg and he's luring him in. And I did a, a subsequent scenes after that when he's still chewing on Pleakley's head and then gets pulled apart. That whole section I had to do. But um, that one in particular, I think is a good example of, of sort of a straight ahead, rough pose approach. 
and then going back in and blocking it out and, and finessing it with my uh, so straight ahead really I think really helps in the loose first phase pass of things and then you can go in um, when it comes to good clear phrasing of dialogue that's when you can really start posing out for me um, when it comes to dialogue or acting dialogue you want to be able to pose those things or get general beats and, I, and attitudes and emotions out so you need to pose those things out and then you add your dialogue and, and, and expressions in later so so you see the stretch you see a squash right here see this you saw what I did is I took I took just random shapes and I added my character over those shapes so you can kind of see how I can stretch and move and squash and even in his, with his eyes too if I wanted to have um, the top of his head I think the top of his head is like a shape uh, of a ball that's been cut off and then you add pupils to it so uh, even even in this sort of shape he's got he's got an eyelid as well so if he wants to if I want to have him kind of look do a half look um, I can So that's that's sort of his his look and uh, for his, his pupil. And then when he looks from side to side, um, and if I want to do a little stretch, you know, I can do a little stretch of his of his uh, of his eyes. You know, he can he can look over here. Right. So we got that, and then even even with his eyeball, I can squash it out. So there's even uh, areas of partials like his his tail can stretch, right? But his tail is broken up into three parts. His tail can squash. All right, so I got a squash here. Stretch. And, you know, like I said, even with his body. So uh, going back to what Jordan was saying, you know, I, I tend to keep him bottom heavy um, for his weight. So that's going to really help me determine how I start to animate this character. Uh, oh, I got it. someone from Celestrio says, hello. Hello to you, Celestrio. Um, Kirk Michael goes, oh, Chadfield says, like, instead of pose to pose. Um I'm not exactly sure if I answered your question, Chad Fields, or not, um, in terms of rough animation and, and going pose to pose as opposed to straight ahead. Um, Kirk Michael says, I seem to go straight ahead with key poses first, then think of the breakdowns after. That's good. That's okay. If you feel like you have, a lot of times when you don't know what you want to do, and also straight ahead animation is good as an exercise for not knowing what you want to do. Um, so, um, you know, for the, for let's say this this particular character, let's say um, I'm gonna have So straight ahead animation is great as a practice exercise, as a warm up exercise, when you don't know what you want to do and you want to be able to, to put something down. It's like gesture drawing to me. Um, a, you know, I do warm up straight ahead animation, 
that is just for me. It's just for me to kind of get the hang of of getting in the, the mindset of, of animating. Because even though we're drawing every day, right? Um, going from storyboarding then to character designing and then to animating takes your takes up they all relate to each other but it also takes particular parts of the brain that gives you you need a little bit of time to ramp up to so it's not always uh, you don't always quickly get to um, switch gears that quickly so straight ahead animation for me as a warm-up exercise is is great um, you know I'm, I'm looking at him in terms of shape um, I've drawn him a few times now, so I, I have a little bit of confidence in what I'm drawing. Um, and then um, I might draw, start with this drawing, this pose. I'm not sure wh what's happening with it, but let's say I will um, put a little background to this. And let's say we'll start our, we'll start from seven and then we'll end it to wherever. Um, well, that's where our animation is going to start. So I'm going to put a background underneath. All right, let's just say we'll go to there. Um, oh, okay, great. Thanks. Okay, Chad Fields, I'm glad that I answered your question. So um, let's see here. We've got Kirk Michael says, uh, again, I seem to go straight ahead with key poses first and think do the breakdowns afterwards. Um, in that mindset, Kirk, um, it's okay to do that, um, especially if it's your own character, like we, we are doing a lot of ourselves at home. Uh, we have our own characters. Um, we need to, uh, we know that um, it's for our, it's, we are the, the kind of like, our, we are the creators. We are the people that are sort of taking this character and making it our own. So we can choose the rules for how we want this character to play in the world that we've created. Um, so there's, there's, there's no wrong answer, there's no wrong approach to what you're trying to do for yourself in terms of your own character. But fundamentally, it's good to know uh, these basic principles so that you can apply it to your own method of animating a character. So it doesn't matter if the end result is one thing, how you get to the end result is completely up to you. And 10 animators can approach the same scene 10 different ways and still get the same results. So you have to under, but you have to understand the fundamentals and the reason why they get to the same result uh, is because they have a basic principle of understanding of movement and animation and shape language. Now, when it comes to acting, um, everyone will approach it uniquely different because we are literally actors on paper and we're going to see expressions and we're going to see acting, we're gonna see poses and movement based on our own personal experience or based on what we see in our head. Um, and so that's and then, so then that's when you get little subtle nuances and detail and differences in acting. Uh, especially with, uh, and that's why certain animators are cast on certain particular characters because they have a certain sensibility in their animation that lends themselves to be that type of actor. Some people are really good with comedy uh, and stretchy, squashy characters. Uh, like look at Eric Goldberg and the genie. Uh, um, you know, he, 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 that role fit him well because that's his style. Uh, you know, he, he sort of had that nice loose Hirschfield. He was really able to take Hirschfield's designs and really translate it well. I think the genie was the best example of, of a Hirschfield inspired uh, character in animating it. Um, then you have uh, people like Aaron or James Baxter or Glenn Keane. Um, they're all phenomenal artists and animators and they approach things slightly different. Uh, Matt Willemay is to Rune Bendicky Brandt. Um, there are, they all have their own unique styles that they bring to the table that make them uniquely theirs. And because of that, directors will cast artists and animators to uh, fit that particular character or that role. Uh, the reason why I got put on Stitch because I like doing fun, animated, stretchy, squashy type of characters. And 
I was put on that character. So, anyways, let's get back to this. So, straight ahead animation. For me, get out of this, I'll start doing this. So, so what I might do is, uh, I do use the onion skin a lot when I do straight ahead, and I, and I do a lot of rolling back and forth. Um, I'm gonna do right there, right there. I'm gonna put a white. Uh, I'm gonna do white so I don't see that back image. There we go. All right, so now I can flip. So straight ahead animation would be like, he's looking at something. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna be like, oh, he, he stretches out. So I'm, and I'm literally just figuring out um, in my head, sometimes I don't even know. Sometimes I just start literally freeforming this. And then as I start moving it around, I start thinking of actions or things that are happening. And again, this is a, a process that I do when I'm just trying to move shapes around and trying to figure out who this character is. Um, let's see, thanks for the tips, bro. Oh, you're welcome there. Um, Celestial Blaze, are you gonna teach summer classes or nah? Oh, uh, I mean, summer classes, uh, you mean summer classes at DigiPen or summer classes online? That would be the question. And the question is, I'm not sure if I'm going to be teaching anything at DigiPen this year uh, over the summer, but um, the goal is to uh, get, ah, the goal is to get um, my online stuff up and running. Uh, probably, I might consider um, doing some sort of animation class uh, over the summer or maybe uh, teach another story class. Um, but, uh, that's still up in the air in terms of it just really comes down to a what's going on with this COVID-19 situation and then b what's how people are going to be approaching uh, production because I'll be done in the next two weeks with my own work of this production I'm on and then uh, I don't know what's going to happen next um, so sky's the limit for me um, uh Maybe it's Netflix, maybe it's another production. Not quite sure what, what I'm gonna do yet. So, he comes up. And um, I think maybe I'll, I'll have him go all the way up right here. So if, but um, if you want me to teach something at DigiPen, if any, any DigiPen kids are out there, students are out there, uh, let me know what you'd be interested in. I mean, you know, so far they've hired me to do uh, story and animation and um, I'm totally open to do that. Um, I was asked if I was gonna do a mentorship program uh, again at, at DigiPen. Um, I'm not sure, but I've been interested in, in possibly doing um, apprenticeships or uh, the independent study uh, with students that have an interest in, in a strong interest in character animation or story. Um, I was considering doing that uh, for students. Uh, what's the mentorship program? Oh, well, the mentorship program was something um, that I had created 
which was learning how to develop an animated short film or TV series from scratch to animatic. So um, the first two times that I did it, actually I'm still working with the students um, from this last semester's class um, where, and they, they actually, we, we developed a really, I think a really fun project that I would like to uh, develop a little bit more with them. Um, and the idea is to get, uh, the end result is to, is to go through a story process to understand how to develop a film. And then the other idea is to, um, is to um, get a portfolio piece of original uh, animation or original storyboards that uh, you can put in your portfolio and say that's uniquely yours. Um, stu you know, story artists um, should have uh, a culmination of like good acting, good staging, good uh, uh, examples of, of acting, action, and comedy. Um, that's that's the thing that, that people are looking for. Uh, they wanna see a, a variety of that. So I created this mentorship program to sort of take, sort of a boot camp to take you through the idea of, of what it would be like to develop your own show because other things that people are looking for is originality. They wanna know that you can come up with your own original concepts um, as a storyteller. So that's what I was trying to do. So Celestrio was going, oh, oh, okay, I'm guessing I can't do that with you in the summer since I'm going to have to take any 151 in the summer, but that's, but that sounds cool. I don't think, so the idea behind this mentorship program is that I'm going to be doing that through Sketch to Animate and uh, offer it to people globally, anybody that has an interest in storytelling and wants to you know, go through the process of being just what it takes to be a better storyteller and, and just understand my, my flow and process. Um, uh, it was pretty successful what I did with the students, although we didn't hit milestones uh, because of certain distractions. One of the hardest things about mentoring and developing something from scratch is the story. You can't move forward until you have a solid story. So um, I worked really hard at trying to kind of fine tune and, and get into that area of, of knowing it. But then the downside is why we're going longer is because we needed to uh, focus on getting their boards out. But as a result, we ended up coming up with a really strong concept. So I was pr that's why I was pretty excited to be working with uh, the students. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going in. So I already know um, I did a pose right here and I want to do one one breakdown where he kind of comes up uh, into this. Let's see, stretch. This is where, like I said before, when I go in and I start uh, designing the character, I'm just moving shapes around to kind of see what I can do, uh, where I can push the character, how I can uh, simplify things. Because um, a lot of times as you draw this, you're, you're trying to find cheats or shortcuts to kind of streamline your animation process so that this character and again, I think it's really important as you design something um, and understand where your stretching and squashing uh, occur and where your limitations are. It's really important to kind of push, put it in, into the animation process as quickly as possible, at least for me. That way you know if, if, the, if this, uh, this character is working or not. Actually, I realize that is down here. So, oh, Celestial goes, oh, Caroline Wilson. Hello, Caroline. Um, Celestial goes, well, if I could actually join then, can I email you about it later? Yes, you can definitely email me about it later. That would be good. Let's see. Um, you can email me anytime. Um, let's see here. So, again...
So, um, and, you know, he's coming up. Now I'm thinking he's, he's looking surprised. So I have him come up a little bit there. Uh, I might do one more in between. And again, this is where I'm thinking, oh, timing wise. That's why I love uh, working digitally now, just because doing straight ahead animation uh, process makes it a lot. Uh, you, you have the ability to go straight ahead more often than not uh, when it comes to uh, animating your characters. And the onion skin I do use when it comes to uh, this type of stuff. So I might just do something loose like this just to kind of get the shape in there uh, and make sure I get the hand popping up into that. Right there. And so the one difficult thing about um, animating straight ahead is you're also thinking about overlap, right? You're thinking about um, how are things typically um, when you do animation, Actually, I'll show you a little bit of this. I was just starting to work on this last night because I never finished this for everybody. And so my goal is to finish this for you guys uh, by tomorrow so you can have it. But um, this is where I'm blocking out everything. Remember this walk that I did last couple of streams ago? And I was doing... Uh, underneath, well, actually, let's turn this off, this off. Uh, this off and this off. And then you remember this animation I was doing. Oh. Just make sure you guys can see that. I got my stuff covered up. Okay. So that was what I had talked about before. But So now I was like, I wanted to do a follow-up around and, and probably add this into a tutorial for everybody um, how to do a walk cycle. So what I'm doing now is I'm just going through and I'm breaking this down and the only reason why I'm showing this is a, as I was talking about um, doing straight ahead animation one of the challenges of doing straight ahead animation is also um, oh, that's not it is also uh, figuring out your overlaps and your drags as you go so and that's the challenge now where when you post something out and you figure it out then you do your overlaps last I, you do the basic body structure of like a walk cycle and then you add all your little nuances like the hair bouncing and the and the uh the hair the the beanie cap bouncing those are all things that are done after you've blocked out the original pose so i'm just going to show you um what i've gotten so far um and again i'm, I'm trying to do this excuse me in between production work um so this will give you a, a good sense of where i'm at with it um so you can kind of see the structure underneath and now where I've, I've taken this. I'm doing it all in ones and I'm doing a nice smooth uh, body. Uh, the structure underneath her, her torso, that's going to be covered up eventually by her sweater. Now I can get rid of that sweater. Uh, yep, that's the sweater right there. I'll get rid of uh, that part. And what's the other thing that I need to get rid of? There we go. Oh. So now you can kind of see. I, I figured out um, my overall body shape. So then I started blocking out the head and then the, the overlap of the, the beanie cap. So now you're getting a good sense of where I'm kind of going with this. And then the weight, all the weight is coming from the backpack is why she's bending over and the way, she, the, way uh, the weight of her feet standing uh, or walking. So that's this is sort of a work in progress where I'm at so far with it. I think it's, it's turning out pretty good so far. 
I like the the little overlap. I might once I'm done with it, I'll look at it again and see where I can finesse some things. But overall, I'm I'm trying to stay close to the character that I've got over to the right. So in this case, blocking this out pose to pose to create a cycle is important to do. Um, sometimes I will go straight ahead and animate something really rough um, and then go back in and figure out the mechanics of it and break it down later because I want to get that idea out of my head. So when it comes back to stretching and squashing and doing straight ahead animation, um, like this character right now, I'm just sort of freeforming what it is that I want him to do um, because I'm exploring not so much the acting as much as I'm exploring uh, what his limitations are as a character for stretch and squash. So <clears throat> he gets in this this pose and then maybe uh, maybe he oh life fantasy X is looking nice. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and so in this case, Maybe you know he does a he does a blink. A slight blink. Maybe his head comes down a little bit. His ears come up a little bit. And here I might show teeth just to show that he's He's doing a slight, a slight uh, blink with his eyes, and then um, maybe his hand starts to come in a little bit. His head starts. His other arm starts to come down a little bit. body can drop down a little bit like that and then bring it maybe bring his tail in So again, I'm just doing the straight ahead, not worrying about what I'm doing. Um, but then as I'm drawing it, then I'm starting to think maybe maybe he does a, a uh, maybe does a, a, a take. Maybe he does a little anticipation where he we see him squash. And the question would be how much do I want him to squash? Um, maybe I, I bring his legs down. Uh, you know, maybe his body comes down a lot more. Um, this is where I can do that little flower sack idea. Um, you know, his his hands, maybe his hands are, are like coming up down here. Do a little loose, little loose drawing, and I go in there and I'll carve it out. Carve out that, that drawing a little bit. See his mouth squashing. See any other any questions? Anybody have any questions while I'm doing this still? Um, in terms of the stretch and squash.
why I'm doing it, what the principles are behind it. Um, any random questions about animation in general? Just give me a holla. I'm looking at my... Uh... Now, I can't see it. Um, so I know some of my students had, had been asking me questions on Twitch. For uh, whatever reason, I cannot see uh, the questions on Twitch. Although, I'm looking right now and seeing seeing if I see anything in this in general. Um, I've got a, a thing called Restream that I use that allows me to see multiple streams uh, and chats for multiple uh, areas like Twitch and Twitter and, and YouTube. So, so now he's getting a little rough here because I'm, I'm trying to figure out this pose. And then maybe I'll have a quick stretch drawing into that. So I'll favor this drawing here. And I'll... So that means I'll just go in here real quickly and draw that up. Oh, you can hear the sounds of someone scrubbing. Oh, can you hear that? Yep, sounds like someone's working in the kitchen today. So you do a quick squash and I can kind of go in here and do that up here. So let's see if there's any questions. Uh, oh, I have a question. Travis, when is C Scalio, oh Calipeg. When is Calipeg coming out? Um, Calipeg, they told me that they're they're working out some um, fixes on a couple of things, and that it should be coming out in the next week. Um, that is as far as I know. Anyone also anyone that is uh, was a contributor to Calipeg, uh, uh, and will be get, those certain people will be getting some animation. Uh, scenes that I did for Calipeg, like the uh, scene where uh, the dogs were running around a circle. I did that all in Calipeg. So I'm giving those files, uh, were, those were to certain donors that gave money. I was giving them original uh, animation from Calipeg so they can see my workflow and process and how I do things. So, and then a couple of original illustrations. And if that brings up, if you, uh, when my website goes live, if and when it goes live. I will give you a little sneak peek here. Um, the image, uh, I will be giving a high res image uh, to those who sign up and I created an original piece of artwork um, and this is the artwork that you'll be seeing um, that will you'll be able to download when you join the blog. You'll be able to get this, this for yourself as a free download as a high res image and uh, it was it's a sort of welcome to the family welcome to sketch to animate um, as a matter of fact I just took this and ordered a print of it and it's gonna be on my my wall soon I did a 30 by 40 inch print of this so that character uh, will be available for download or this this shot will be available for download when you join sketch to animate but not yet because the the website has not been launched and when it does get launched I will definitely uh, let everybody know for sure. So I'm going to blow into this a little bit so we can see this character coming to life. So you can already see, you know, he's coming up right there. And he, he comes down. Boom. You can kind of see this action happening. Um, He 
it comes down right here and I might I might hold this uh, a little bit longer um, I'm gonna pose it because I'll add some in between to this and then he might be on I'll put him on eights right there and I'm gonna really uh, actually I might do one more pose of him really squashing just so we can get the idea of the stretch and squash that we're talking about today uh, really push him even further there you go Oh, so let's see here. Celestrio goes, do you have a limit to how many people you're going to handle for a mentorship? I'll probably ask James if he wants to join. Um, not exactly sure yet. Uh, typically, I like to be able to do it with uh, four to six, uh, maybe eight. Uh, that way we can, when we manage uh, a mentorship program, uh, we're working in teams. We're working, part of the, the mentorship program is working as a team to getting... Uh, the, the, the benefit of understanding what it means to work with a group of people and having to work because when you go into the story world, um, especially in features, you work with a team typically. Uh, even, even with me working remotely, I'm still working with a team of other story artists and uh, in particular like the head of story um, for the production that I'm on now. I, I get uh, weekly uh, check-ins with him, I actually go through and show him what I'm working on and we kind of go through, uh, they give me notes, they talk about what they want me to do and what they, what they like, what they don't like. And so typically when you're working in-house, uh, you're working closely with other story artists and, and team members. Um, even though if you're working in TV, you might get your own uh, section of a show or you might get your own show in general but I always find it really nice to be able to have a good camaraderie with your fellow artists uh, especially your other story artists uh, because it's good to get feedback it's good to have uh, an, another artist's eye to be kind of when you're stuck in something or in a rut and you don't know how to um, figure out a particular shot or a staging of something it's good to be able to go, hey, I got a question for you. Can you help me uh, with a shot? I don't know what I'm doing or um, I'm having trouble kind of looking at this. And that character, that person might go, oh, yeah, why don't you try this? Why don't you try this angle? Or maybe maybe the character needs, the character needs to be more of an upshot for this particular moment. Um, so it's really good to have that feedback. So with a mentorship program, typically one of the, the components to having this program is to be able to understand how to work with other people. Um, it helps build uh, leadership, uh, uh, helps build uh, clear, better communication for you as an artist uh, so that you can, you can, um, and then, and to understand what it means to give positive criticism, you, you know, good feedback, positive feedback. So, squash, so you're squashing down. Actually, um, reset this. I think I might have him do this because I think my arc, thinking where my arc is, oh, where his hands are coming down, makes for a better, a little better arc. So if I hold this for X amount of frames, and then I want to uh, stretch the character out where he's going to jump. Let's see here if I, oh, I gotta do a mark out. Let's do a mark out here. Let's let's get him to uh, 30. And let's see where how it's playing so far. So you can kind of see. And again, 
I'm trying to I'm trying to move him around to create shape language to figure out what works and what doesn't work with him. Um, so you can start to see it moving. Celestio, is it going to be based on a first come first serve basis? I'm not sure yet. Uh, probably it's going to be if I did do it. Um, if you're talking about DigiPen, it would be portfolio based. Um, Chad Fields goes, random question, any opinions on class animation and their development of class? Um, opinions? I freaking loved it. I, I think um, I think the way they approached it was great. Um, Sergio is a phenomenal animator. Um, I know he, he knows exactly what he wants, and I'm sure he can be uh, a hard ass when it comes to that, excuse my French, uh, because he knows what he wants. But everyone that I met on the team... Um, you know, after the fact that uh, when I was done at CTN, absolutely loved working on the project, loved working with uh, Sergio, and uh, his process was spot on. I think how we approach the animation, if you look at all the walk cycle tests that they're doing, uh, they're amazing, they're absolutely incredible. Um, it's, it's a good example of, of a new type of pipeline that I think could exist uh, and to allow us to do another feature film in uh, 2D that could be marketable and profitable for the industry as a whole. I mean, really what it comes down to is um, telling the right story in animation and telling the right story for 2D animation. Um, and will it sell? Will it, will it serve an, a general audience that really will uh, resonate with it and want to come back and see it again and again? I mean, most of everything that we do on line is based on uh, what we you know see in the screens is based on what p they think people want to see and it, you know part of it's commercialized and marketing but really it's just telling a good story um, when it comes down to it so celestial goes can you explain shape language uh, how to uh, and then Luke Zhao says how to deal with body parts moving at the same time uh, let's see so shape language, which is what I talked about before, uh, moving parts at the same time, shape language. Um, I, I, I said this character was based on sort of uh, a series of cones and triangles, right? Um, is how I, I kind of base this character. Even the arms are a series of cones and triangles. Uh, and even the tail is broken up into a series of cones and triangles. And then there's and then there's his head or eyeball that's just the the sort of acts as his cranium, and even his even his his ears are sort of a series of triangles, and then his hands are sort of like that. Um, so once I figure it out again, once I figure out my shape language of how I want this character to be, I start doing. Uh, I'll go back to this again and I start figuring out shapes so um, I know that I, I figure out the rules what are the rules of the character what what's the world gonna be and then I think of the shape language that I've created for the character and I think of okay how does he live and how does he move around in this world so I start doing quick gestures and I and this these were super super loose but this is like a stretch I think of him He's bottom heavy, so he's he's got a lot of weight to his butt. So wherever he moves or he falls, everything's gonna fall based off off of his torso bottom area, and everything drags from there. So in this case, I drew this little sack potato sack idea with uh, his the ball, and then that would be a drawover, you know, a quick gestural drawover of what he might look like. Um, over here, I did drew this, and I drew uh, tracks over that, and then again. I uh, started talking about the ball concept and the flower sack concept and the shape of the cone of what the character looks like. And then based on that, I was able to draw uh, his character over those shapes. Again, looking for ways to create a, a, a unified shape language that's consistently looking the same, no matter even if I stretch him out really long 
like if I really stretch him out, you know, what what's what makes tracks still look like tracks? Um, you know, what what is gonna what is gonna make him not look like tracks and then come back from there? Um, part of the the part of doing stretching and squashing and, and doing straight ahead animation like I'm doing for me is testing out the character. It's like testing the rig out, testing out his limitations, testing out where he needs to he, he needs to go or what he, he how distorted can I get him before he doesn't look like tracks anymore and then come back from that. Uh, so even if I'm stretching him out really far like this, Uh, and I'm stretching his legs. This, he still has that sense of tracks. So I know, I know that, you know, the ball's down here. I can go in there and I'll just do uh, a quick color so you can see it better and then there you go and I do these quick shades in here just so I can see his shape a little bit more I don't know, for some reason when I draw and I do a little quick color, it just helps me see, solidify the shape and look and feel of what I'm trying to do. And I can go in and So I can really stretch him out really far and still have him look like, oh, you, you know what? You can't even see that, can you? I just noticed that. Let me move Let me move that character over so you can see that better. There you go. So I just did this, this quick stretch to kind of show you how I can push and feel the character and, and how far and, and stretchy he can really get. Um, when it comes to, uh, let's see. Oh, I got a new person in here. Uh, William Wink gives me a heart. I love you, William Wink Winkler. Uh, I have someone that says, is it always compulsory time or more, perhaps spacing both hands differently, even though doing the same thing? Um, I would say do what feels right. If it, if it serves a purpose, if both hands come out at the same time or one hand comes out, a delay. Um, if you want to add a little bit of delay for one hand or the other it depends on the action or what you're trying to accomplish um, but overlapping action you don't want everything to happen at the same time it it might be nice to like for instance when I, I am I am animating this character it's this action they're sort of happening at the same time right this is sort of happening at the same the hand this hand is up here uh, this hand up, uh, you can't see what I'm drawing this hand is coming up first and this hand is sort of following a little bit after, but they're getting there um, relatively at the same time. Him squashing, actually, I need to see that squash there. I could even probably squash him down even more. Now, everything's happening at the same time. And actually, This pose, this pose actually is falling out of the arc. Um, you can see how it's popping in and out. Let's see if we can play it. I like to, again, when I'm exploring this character like I am right now, this is, it isn't about doing a performance test. It's about figuring out where my stretches and squashes are, where I can push the character um, how far I can push the character, what are my limitations. Um, that's what I'm, I'm kind of focusing on right now when it comes to, to tracks in particular. Um, so moving, let's see here, moving the hands, um, 
how do you deal with body parts moving at the same time? So to answer that question, when it comes to like tracks or any character, this is why it's important to really understand a shape of something. If, if, if this is a, a basic human character, with feet uh, and I'm just doing it in very simple terms it's it's good to understand what the shape of that character is, whether it's a, a character that looks like, you know, this type of character that's got sort of a bulky shape with little, little torso of feet, little legs, big chest, you know, little arms. When it comes to body parts, you gotta you gotta know the general breakdown of the shape language. Forget about the details. Understand the anatomy. Understand what the structure is of that character, um, and that's gonna help you become to better understand how you move the parts individually. Um, so you know, once once I have a character like that, let's see here. I can go. Okay. Oop. Nope. Let me get to this. And I will put my onion skin on so you can kind of see this. I'll bring it right about here. So, you know, there's a shoulder, there's a forearm, there's bicep and tricep area, there's a mid torso area, there's the, the uh, lower leg, a uh, hip, butt area, and then you have your legs. All of these have parts the same as, you know, the head right there. So once you have that and you know the shape, then it's, it's just a matter of, of finding out how you want to exaggerate and stretch those shapes out. And not worrying about uh, the details, but really understanding the shape, language, and the structure behind what you're trying to design or animate as a character. Um, I always try to break it down into its simple shapes so that we can So later on, I can go in and figure out what it is that I'm doing. Same with this this guy. You know, if, if you know he wants to bring his lay, his hands out like this, so like so. I know my general shapes of what I'm trying to get across. So I can maneuver into it. Okay. Uh, what is? I'm looking at this is Kirk Michael goes K Pax K Pax character great squash and stretch for three. Oh, I've never even heard of that. Okay. Caroline says, how do you decide on what the anatomy is of an alien type of character? Do you plan out the bone structure? I'm guessing Stitch got tricky with forearms and spikes. Actually, yes, everything has structure to it, which I've talked about before. Um, everything that you do has structure. Um, even this character, um, Stitch, or um, Trax, has, has structure to it. Um, I'm going to get rid of these guys real quick. Uh, make sure that I'm in the right section. Get rid of this. Uh, get rid of this. 
um, I want to I want to stay on track with what I'm talking about, but with an alien character, it's about shape. Remember, I, I talk about what is your shape. What are you What are you trying to get across? Um, you know, if if you're doing a random shape like this, uh, or a random shape like this, versus figuring out what does your alien creature look like. You know, does does the alien creature have, you know, a head, a torso, and tentacles for legs. Uh, does your character or alien, and it has little, um, you know, tentacles for arms. I'm, I'm trying to find a shape language. Does does your character have one eye? And lots of teeth. And just a blob, you know, it's or a see-through blob. And it doesn't have, it. It's it's just that shape. That shape is defining a certain structure, a certain form um, with when it comes to like, let's say, tracks, tracks, I've created my own little bone structure for him. I have sort of a head um, and I've created like this little anatomy of him that I've, I, I literally have a bone structure that I've designed and hips um, so that he has this certain anatomy um, that happens uh, when it comes to his tail, I've created a, a shape language. But um, with that being said, he's also a very malleable uh, character. But I always say it's important to find the form within, even if it's a if it's a loosey goosey kind of tentacle, um, you know. And that's and let's say this is the resting form of a tentacle. You still want to understand, like, if this is sort of the general resting, non-stretching shape, um, you can look at this as a structural shape design uh, in terms of what it looks like in terms of silhouette. It's just this. When it comes to uh, something that doesn't have, let's say, a bone to it, you still want to see the the shape within the shape, and make sure that when it squashes, it still feels like the character, it still feels like the tentacle. So you, you're you're making sure that you're you're using that same equal amount of space that you did to fill this void. You're using that same amount of space to squash it. Remember the mass, the mass, even though it's getting squashed, is still going to be the same, just sp spread out more in terms of what's within the shape. Oh, sounds like my dogs are going out to go to the bathroom. So, you know, this is being stre uh, squashed and then the same token, um, am I using the same space or what's filling up this space and just stretching it out more while, um, wait, wait, that's the dogs getting their commands. So the stretch can happen and it still looks like the tentacle because the tentacle is still using the same mass but just being stretched out over or over a, a longer period of time uh, longer area of space so I don't know if that makes sense it's more like you know if you if you fill up a jar full of sand 
and then that then all of a sudden you sprinkle that sand out uh, in one area that same amount of sand that's there is the same amount that's in there that mass or space has to equal the same amount that's in here you're just stretching it in a different way uh, the stretch and squash help in okay the stretch and squash help in moving holes um, yeah you could I mean it really depends the moving hold um, depends on if you want to keep a body uh, that's where partials come in. So if you if you have, for instance, a uh, let's get out of this real quick. I'm gonna hide, get rid of those because I still want to do my my last stretch for this character so we can kind of see what he's doing. Um, let's see here. Why am I seeing you? Oh, that's why I'm seeing you. There you go. Go right there. So, um, so if you have a moving hold, basically, if a moving hold works well when you have a head, let's say someone, someone is looking at something. But they've they've got you know they've got long flowing hair. If this character, you know, if this character was um, not moving, the head wasn't moving. Um, I would separate one way to help out with moving holds is is to keep something slightly moving or a body part maybe the hand is moving maybe the hair like this hair is flowing but the head is not moving um, that's where you can have a hold on a on a on a shape here and then have this the partial on a separate layer the hair here would be on a separate layer and you'd animate the hair flowing or cycling while maintaining uh, this one position of this character right so moving holds uh, something like this could work as a moving hold um, moving holds also are things where you um, a lot of times we want to um, our focus isn't on this particular character um, I think a lot of times if you have a main character that's not moving or doing anything but you want to show of interest Sometimes you want to have the hair moving or something going or something is or that character is focused on something in particular and what some of the ways we would do in traditional animation is we do um, rather than just being one drawing uh, because even your pencil line every time we do a new stroke isn't exactly the same as the second stroke that you put down so a lot of times you would do these holds where if, if a character is just sort of standing there in one spot um, unless it's a whole group of them, if it's just like one or two characters in one spot, we might do two or three tracebacks of that character and cycle it. And what it does is it, it keeps the, the, the pencil alive. And even though it's not moving, we're doing tracebacks and we're cycling those tracebacks, it allows it to breathe a little bit, to give it a little bit of life without it looking like it's just a frozen pose of one drawing. Um, those frozen poses, and it again, it depends on the film or what you're trying to do. So, um, sorry, Travis Baymax from B Big Hero Six. What are you talking? Oh, okay. Um, so, yep, that makes sense to me anyway. Um, okay. So, does stretch and squash help in moving holds? Stretch and squash can help. Like, if 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 this character, this character here, is moving. And I want, I want, I don't want this character to be held just as it is. Um, let's get rid of, oh, get rid of that. 
and we'll get rid of this. And then I'm going to end because it's already 1.30 and I've gone way over my limit of what I was going to do. But um, I've been getting a lot of good questions, so that's great. So if, if I'm going to do a squash, like this character is squashing, but he's already at the final squash. Let's say his legs and feet and everything else are at the final squash, um, along with his with his hands. Um, one of the things I could do is is keep the tail, and I want the tail to keep moving, or the arms to keep moving. I can hold, I can hold the uh, body right where it's at. And let's say I keep the body on eight and I hold it on eights uh, right there, but I want to keep the arms moving down, I can put the arms on a separate layer. Now, again, this is when I'm not doing straight ahead animation. Um, I, can, I can do this and figure out um, and then maybe the tail starts to settle down a little bit right here. And the arm starts to come down a little bit right here. And the arm starts to come down. That's where little partials and moving holds can help. Uh, having overlaps uh, in your stretch and squash where I can have these character these movements still happening after the, the main body has settled down I can just keep going and have it so even though the, the arm is right there I could I could have there we go let's go to 36 so in, in a nutshell where I'm just sh trying to show an example where you have the body on a partial and then the hands and tail are still moving down um, that's where you can do like moving holds or um, overlaps where the body hits first and holds there and you don't want to redraw the body but you want to move everything else that's as long as something's moving slightly um, this can work and be pretty successful at doing that um, question I have to practice on a dialogue test and I'm using my own voice recording but my delivery sounds stiff and forced I'm not used to recording myself what can I do to make it better um, well it's hard to say practice is one thing uh, with your voice um, I've got a you don't see it here I got a little mic that I talk into that's right there um, when you do voice recording um, you got to get over the idea of what your voice sounds like because it's gonna be really weird and uncomfortable but go to the extreme do your line of dialogue like you've been doing it and then think of a motivation. Think of what would I say if I was happy when I'm saying that and then deliver the line and then go, okay, how would I feel if I'm sad and deliver the line and do more than one take, two, two or three, but then push it. It's like do, it's like stretching and squashing. You have your pose, your shape, your idea, the, the, the intent of what you want to record now push it, push it, stretch it, stretch it out as far as you can before it's like, no, nah, that's way, way too much. Get out of that comfort zone and like really belt out the, the emotion that you want to do. Try to find the middle ground of what you're trying to get across so that um, it will help at least, even if it's not the final voice, but it's slowly, uh, it's close to what you want. 
it's just really practicing and getting out of your comfort zone. But think of the same principles of the stretch and squash and apply it to voice recording. Push it further than you, you know, a lot of times we deliver our lines and are flat. And that's typical with everyone. And then you gotta go, okay, okay, I'm gonna do it again. And then you go really extreme, you go, no, no, okay, that's not too much. Then we gotta push it back. So you gotta find that extreme uh, where you where you are, where you are, your base, and then your extreme of how much is too much, and then start finding that middle ground. And it's practice and practice. And the more you do it, the better you get. And that's my advice in terms of getting your voice recording to work. Um, hopefully life fantasy, that was life fantasy X's question. I hopefully, hopefully that helps. So I'm going to wrap this up because we're getting late and it's, it's a, it's a long, long, long live stream. Um, one of the things I, again, what I talked about for straight ahead is, you know, I'm just, all I'm doing straight ahead for, for this purpose is understanding where I want to stretch the character, how I want to, to, to stretch the character out. Um, and he's diving forward. So, let's see, we'll get, maybe this go a little bit longer. Go right here, 46, we'll mark it out there at 46. Um, and then maybe Also, it's understanding where my arcs are going. Okay, I'll try that out. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Celestria, also I picked up your brother's animation package since it went it went cheap. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad that you uh, picked it up. I think that's a, uh, his animation package is a really good package to have. Um, again, I'm, let's see, play this out real quick. So you can kind of see how I'm messing around with the characters and seeing where I can I can push him maybe box his head squashes as he And when it comes to these these kind of loose drawings that I'm doing, um, I'm still thinking of this straight ahead, and I'm just thinking big shapes. 
and then we'll I'll go back in and I'll tie that quickly tie that back down Maybe he'll roll out a screen. So how far did that take me? It took me all the way to 49. So then, again, this is this is merely just me trying to figure out my shape language with tracks. Again. And again, this is this is mostly just for me to play around with the shapes and figure out what's working with him and what isn't working with him. And that's it. I'll go in and, and uh, take that drawing right there. Literally, I could take that drawing and have fun uh, finding my stretch in that. How I want to how I want to I push that drawing. You know, maybe I want to stretch his ears out a little bit more as I, I go into that drawing. Um, but this is a good way, like I said, to, to figure out where your shapes are with your character. Uh, is it working or not? Well, how can I improve it? How can I simplify the design um, by doing these, these stretch and squash exercises and um, your overlaps? So, and... Um, and your, your uh, straight ahead uh, practice exercise. So that's it for me. Um, uh, I'll just keep playing this, I guess. Um, please, if you like this, um, sign up for my YouTube. Uh, I'm at sketch to animate on YouTube. Um, I will be opening up a website soon. Um, also, um, check out my Back to Basics tutorial series that I'm doing. I'm gonna be doing one on Flower Sack coming up next. Um, I did one on recently a bouncing ball and why it matters and it's actually kind of relevant because my brother will be doing a um, I think it's a patreon I'm not exactly sure I have to ask him again but he's doing a big workshop where he's inviting I think over 300 and something people are, have already signed up for this where he's gonna go through and, and talk about the basics of animation talk about stretching and squash of the bouncing ball and the flower sack and so I think this might be a good segue uh, to check out what I'm doing, but also to go to uh, his, his, his uh, sign up for this event. Um, it's really, really, really inexpensive. And I think it'd be fun and informative. And I think you'll get an opportunity to, uh, to get some really good experience in terms of character animation and the basics of animation. So with that being said, um, go out and try this exercise. Take it with your character. Try practicing with tracks and uh, post something. Let me see what you guys have done. Uh, try some stretching and squashing of your own characters. Really uh, identify what it is that you wanna do when, when it comes to character. And as always with animation, it's always about telling the story. What is the story behind? Everything you do has to have an intent. Everything you do has to have a story and a purpose. So um, with that, I hope you guys have a great day. Please stay safe, wash your hands. Uh, this week now more than ever uh, here in terms of the United States and, and, and Washington is a really important time for us to practice and keep our social distance and, and really think about others. Um, 
this is a time when we really need an opportunity to really think about our family, our friends, and everyone around us and what we can do to play our part. So have a great day. Um, again, if you like this, please like or comment and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I look forward to you next Wednesday. And with that, I'm going to do my uh, outro. Uh, int let's see here. Got to do my little outro video. And again, I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care and cheers.